Thank you. Um, I want to apologize for, uh, for uh, being a little bit late. Um, Anthony blames the train, but I have to be honest, being French, I also have a very soft schedule. So um, I'm sorry, I'm I was just a little bit in rush, so just let me um, cool down a little bit the time to start the presentation. So, um, yeah. So first, I will drink. And just while we are setting up, can I just know who has heard of weight or is a little bit familiar with weighted transducer, weighted finite state transducer? All right, so I think you guys can have a break and uh, we'll meet uh, <laughs> each other this afternoon. No, I think uh, actually it's uh, probably some, I will try to give a, um, some kind of introduction to weighted um, finite state transducer from a different perspective than you're accustomed to. And that's the whole point. Uh, I'm use this one. And uh, so, so we today we'll kind of revisit uh, old stuff, but from a, let's say a fresh look, and hope to see eventually that there are something uh, still interesting about this uh, kind of uh, tool of the past, and, and we'll be able to to get some uh, some more out of it. So, yep. All right. So um, that's about the only time I will speak about speech today, almost. So I, I want to uh, to, to uh, look to, to give some some motivation of this uh, of this uh, lecture of this um, of this exploration of a weighted finite state transducer, and it is from a historical perspective. So this is just uh, roughly the, the way I see um, um, a speech recognition. The, the basically the trajectory of how speech recognition evolved. There were a work on speech recognition, obviously, before that, but let's say the modern approach to speech recognition dates roughly to the 70s, uh, led by the well-known uh, Frederick Jelinek, where he was basically um, laying off the, the, the foundation of, um, of uh, what was called the, the, the noisy channel approach, so basically a probabilistic approach to the problem of speech uh, recognition. And what I want to look with you is eventually some key cornerstone or some, some important steps that um, arrive in along the way of this uh, development. So the first one is maybe the, the, the hidden mark of the hidden mark of toolkit or hidden mark of uh, approach where we started to, to look at the, the, the speech problem to, to, to something which look uh, like this. So if I start the drawing here. So basically we started to say, okay, we have some uh, a sequence of states, so the, 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 um, the speech signal can be explained by some hidden states, so this is not observed, and we have some, some Markov chains, and we have some signal, and what we are interested in is somehow finding what is the best uh, sequence, this is best alignment to these states, basically. So this is a very fundamental uh, step because it kind of relates the, 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 um, the basis of, of speech recognition or let's say sequence to sequence learning to a problem where we have a, um, some kind of primary state transducer or state acceptor, we'll see uh, wh what it is, to the problem of speech recognition. So we already have in speech recognition as early as the 80s a problem which is to map a continuous signal to a discrete level of sequence and the way we do it is uh, with the use of finite state transducer or acceptor or loosely speaking for now just graph. So if you look now, uh, this is already early and almost at the same moment there is also already neural network. So the, the time delay neural network, there were other network. And what is important is like basically these two approaches were already here 30 years ago and already in the 90s both approaches were combined together. So uh, they were combined, so they were first you will train a neural network that will uh, take the signal as input and you try to output some, say the probability of the phone or probability of the words. And then you will combine these uh, scores given by the acoustic model to some graph. So you are trying to again get the, the some kind of, from the output of the neural network, you would try to get some pass in a graph and that would be the whole process of learning the speech to, to basically to decode speech. And the thing which is interesting though to, not to note is that the both world, the neural network world and the, the finite state transducer world were basically held separated during training. So we would train the neural network with some approach, let's say cross-entropy or some uh, regular uh, uh, gradient propagation. 
And on the other, th on the other side, we would uh, basically not exactly train transducers, so the graph that would s symbolize your decoder would not be trained, or it would be, let's say, constructed from uh, uh, linguistic knowledge. So we'd have uh, linguists defining rules about what are the, the possible sentences in, um, in, a, in a language. And uh, we would know eventually that a word is pronounced that way, so a word, let's say, hello, should be mapped to her, hell, uh, oh. So it's not something that we would learn exactly from the data, but this graph would represent knowledge, and then the neural network would give some information, and we'd combine this information with knowledge, trying to get at the end some, some kind of decoding. So again, on my storyline, so we have the, 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 the notion of speech that is mapped to the problem of finding a path in a graph, and on the other hand, we have the neural network approach that tries to learn something from the data to somehow get some, some, uh, some uh, trigger, some perception. And the, 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 the golden period of WFST will reach like the 90s, 2000, where we start to have a, a very solid theory of how to construct this graph. So here I just draw the single uh, line of states. You can imagine that the speech recognition system is something absolutely, a graph which is absolutely gigantic. It's something which is taking hundred thousand of states, probably millions, and eventually arcs. And, and, and no matter what you do, your state is always too small because your vocabulary is literally, literally infinite. So during the 90s, 2000 era, there will be a lot of work trying to show how can we, from very basic building blocks, build this uh, type of neural, uh, this type of um, big decoder from very basic elements. And but then, so so it was, it will really shine and it will really give very very nice uh, improvement in the speech recognition um, uh, realm. <coughs> Sorry. But then, starting from the 2000, 2010, we also know that the neural network kind of started to become more and more prominent. And strangely enough, the, the, as the, the neural network were becoming more and more, um, let's say, used by the community, uh, weighted finite state transducer become less and less used. And this is actually for good reason. Because when we started to use, let's say, the end-to-end -end approaches, we rely on um, on algorithms that were uh, usually ha require a very heavy computation, think about the GPU. And they were having some, putting some kind of constraint on the way you calculate things. And these constraints, this highly parallelizable environment, were not very fitted to the problem of weighted finite state transducer. There is also the problem of back propagation when you start to train everything. So the, the paradigm of end to end is really you, 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 you let the, the system derive the rules of your uh, decoding process just by itself, just by the data. And remember that the WFSC was just uh, handcrafted rules that doesn't really fit along the paradigm. So um, as a matter of fact, like the end-to-end -end approach took over and we kind of lost the WFST framework. And, and that's a little bit of pity because even though the WFST is not, um, cannot replace neural network, it's not designed for the same purpose. The fact is, we have lost something along the way, and that was uh, the message of this long um, uh, introduction, is just to tell, well, we went from neural network combining neural network and graphs, and that gave us tremendous progress. And then we, start, we shifted the paradigm to going from a completely data-driven approach where we'd have uh, just a neural network on everything. But my point here is that these graph approaches were having a lot of uh, uh, advantages. So if you look a little bit about this very rough comparison but of, of uh, end to end and, and WFST, end to end are simple and that's probably one of their best features is like any undergrad or even uh, any students basically can start a Python script and train a neural network and in five minutes build, a, I don't know, not a speech recognition system, I hope, but something like a digit recognition. WFST, had, uh, the, 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 the downside of neural network is also that they are black box. Of course, they learn everything from the data, but we have losing the ability to combine them with weighted finite state transducer. We, we, we have lost uh, the possibility to really inject rules as the way we did. So this is a little bit annoying because now we are facing like, uh, let's say, performant machines that sometimes fail and we have no idea why they fail because we have no idea about the inference process. On the contrary, WFST are, by construction, explaining all the steps they are making to reach the final um, uh, goal. So, in a sense, WFST are naturally explainable and your network are not. 
And also, and this is maybe the big disadvantage right now, is like when you start to train everything end to end, then you end up with a neural network which is big, neural network that will train everything from the data, but then if you need to change something, you most of the time have to retrain everything or at least a significant part of it. So just imagine you train a neural network to, to organize a speech uh, at the university. And suddenly you try to apply your system in a, I don't know, in a restaurant, the language model is changing because the context is changing. Therefore, your neural network will not perform as well and you will need to retrain things. The fact is the neural network, the end-to-end -end approach is, is, a, is monolithic. It's a single block. And the, the benefit of having a neural network and plus some kind of graph decoding was the ability to, to modularize things. And therefore, if we need to change just the language component, the language model component, then it was just a matter of a few seconds, and we can just adapt a little bit the, the chain process of the neural network, of the inference of the, new, of, the, of the ASR pipeline. So for all this reason, I think that the WFST is something, I understand it's a little bit something uh, old, so it's not something that we are doing nowadays, but I still think it has value, and the question is, how can we turn it back in a sense to, to bring it back into our toolbox of machine learning prediction? So my, my message here is not that we need to replace neural network with WFST, it's, it would be pointless. It's not, WFST are not made for, for the same thing as neural network. It's just to enable the combination of both worlds uh, when we want and for the task we want. Um, yeah, I'm, so far I didn't introduce weighted finite state transducers, so people that are not familiar with just think of it as a graph and, and that, that's fairly enough. So today we'll try to, to do uh, two things. We'll try to revisit the weighted finite state transducer framework from the perspective of linear algebra. So the main question is obviously why are we going to do this? Once again, the, the reason like WFST got lost al along the way, is it was mostly for practical reasons. Like it was um, when we shifted to neural network, we started to use a lot of GPU, a lot of very specific uh, uh, um, computing uh, uh, constraint, and this constraint does not apply easily. Or are not, um, uh, it's not easy to build a WFST framework that will basically uh, scale on your GPU and you can compute something with your graph, get the gradient out of it. This is actually technically difficult to implement. Some people try, some are very skilled people uh, try. You might have heard about, let's say, a K2, um, the Cardi, uh, um, um, let's say, a new version. And we have a presentation of uh, Dan, the, the, the maker of K2, I'm telling, uh, just telling it's difficult to make it. So I think this guy is good and we need to listen. It's, it's, there is some kind of a ceiling of complexity and we, we kind of need to break. The, 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 the once you express your algorithm in terms of matrix vector operation, you're making yourself the possibility to, to actually use all the, the, um, the tools that you're using with neural networks. That is, like making algorithms highly parallelizable that can scale on a GPU uh, that can be hundreds or thousands of times faster. In a sense, you also greatly facilitate the computation of the gradient. So, so once you get, when you have matrix vector multiplication, you know how to derive this rule, so that should be fine. We won't talk too much about backpropagation today, but it's just to eventually to, to motivate the reason why I'm looking about this matrix vector re representation of WFST. And also, um, regarding the, the complexity, WFST is something which is difficult. Uh, at least to me, it's something that is not natural. And adding, there is also, in my sense, if we want to broadcast the, 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 the technology of speech recognition and, and, and similar, we need to lower the bar, the entry level for engineers, because not everybody who is going to use speech recognition system is going to have a PhD in machine learning. And having a representation that is simple enough to, to be used by most engineers is something that, in my opinion, has a lot of value. So, so that's about the motivation, why I want to actually go for this, um, um, to go for this um, uh, matrix version of, or linear algebra version of WFST. And you also might be wondering, but uh, okay, so it's graph and matrices, it's, it should have been done before, right? And probably if you had lecture on graph, you might think that uh, you probably have heard the like, notion of adjacency matrix, incidence matrix, and you're completely correct. Actually, we, we can date the representation of graph as matrices as early as 1930s, and there was probably more before. And the, 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 this representation of graph and matrices was mostly theoretical, 
and not so much apply for good reason. When you have a matrix representing your graph as a matrix, it's a lot, a lot of memory, and therefore you want to. It's it's not easy to to make it practical in a sense not to waste memory and to to make it very. Um, um, to make it uh, sufficiently practical to use it in practice. It's a nice theoretical tool, but in practice it's difficult. Um, however, things have changed, and this is probably due to the progress of the computing uh, uh, knowledge. So, so uh, this work is, is greatly enabled by new programming language. So here I'm using Julia, there are probably other languages. And the fact is there were a lot of, um, let's say, progress in, in, in terms of programming languages in the sense like it allows us to do something more complex and more efficiently in a let's say less line of code in a in a more uh, in a simpler fashion and and this has really lowers uh, the obstacle uh, uh, obstacle leading to the to the the problem of let's say representation of graph and matrices because suddenly we were able to implement algorithms that were uh, before complex in a very just in a, in, in a few line of code. So that's where it's really a game changer. So I will use Julia, it's probably not the only language that would be fitted for the task, but I think it's a very nice uh, programming language. And, and it's actually interesting that the Julia language, so it's date from the 2010, I think from a MIT team, were actually uh, uh, made by people who, who work on graph and, and work on, um, on um, let's say, a trend of work that were mixing matrix and graphs. So in a sense, this Julia programming language is a little bit the offspring of this let's say, last decade of research on graph. And that's why it's, it also feels very natural to use it uh, when you're implementing graph algorithms. So along this presentation, I'll give you some tips on pointers and to give some new example on Julia language, in hopefully that you will get familiar with. And probably uh, this afternoon, you will uh, shine at implementing a very hi highly complex uh, WFST algorithm. All right, so let's start to, to enter the, 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 real, uh, the real work. So today, so, so after this, um, let's say, lengthy introduction, I will go through the, the, the I will give um, an introduction to the weighted finish state transistor framework. It won't be by any means uh, complete, so apologies for, for the expert of you. So I'll go over the, the classical, classical uh, steps, so summering, finite state automata, and uh, then how can we represent things as matrices and everything. Um, the main... Um, um, this is um, the one of the very, very important features of summerings of the of weighted automata, sorry. So, so automata is more or less a graph. We'll see what it is in, um, in more details later on. But the, 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 the extremely valuable features of, uh, of um, when it f uh, finite state transducer is the fact that they have weights on the arcs. And these weights are not just random number. I mean, these are not just numbers. They can be literally anything. And to make the weighted finite state transducers a very rich framework, we need to define basically uh, uh, what we mean by weight, what we mean by number, and we need to generalize a little bit uh, this notion of number to, to have some, let's say, to, to be allowed to use our framework to a very wide family of, of quote-unquote numbers. And basically what we need to make is a contract and what are the operations I can use on these weights and given that your weights actually respect this operation, we know that a family of algorithm will work. And that's very important because it's also like we, we will be able to separate the, the algorithmic aspect of it from the, the somehow the, the meaning of it. So when using a certain type of weight, you will be cal calculating the some quantities and when using a different type of weight, you will using the same algorithm, you might end up with a different interpretation of the quantities you get. So the first uh, thing look, we will look at is the notion of monoid. So this is a very basic uh, building block. A monoid is just a set, and it has one operation, which is, uh, you can call it uh, the way you want, let's call it the multiplication, and it has a neutral element. So, so in a sense, like we have uh, x, uh, which belongs to a set, and this element, I can multiply it with, let's say, x and y, and I can multiply it, and that gives me uh, uh, another um, element. And this element also belongs to, to m, so that's uh, the purpose of the monoid. So, so basically, all the operation will remain within the set of the operation. And the key part is that he has, um, he has a neutral element, meaning that... Uh, can I erase this... Uh, 
Well, too late. So, so this neutral element just states that if you have something multiplied by uh, one, or one multiplied by something, um, then we get also the same thing. We get x, x and x. So that's basically the neutral element. So in a sense, this monoid just defines us like uh, one set with one possible operation. And here, you can just imagine that this, uh, this operation is basically whatever you want. It has just respect, it has respect this property, the neutral element, and the fact that when you multiply x and y, you obtain an element from the, from the, sum, uh, from the monoid. Yeah. By, by one, you mean some special element of the set, right? You don't exactly. mean the number one. Exactly. And here, the, the, the magic of the framework is x is not necessarily a number. It's, it can be anything. So let me uh, address uh, Sanjeev's uh, remark with the following example. Let's say that we have a, a, a string. So, so basically, we have a, a set M, which is basically made of all possible string, or let's say uh, A, AA, and so on and so forth. And we have... Uh, one, so the one will be one element. One element of this set will be one, basically. What will be what we call one. It's just an element of this set in such a way that this operation is somewhat effectless. So maybe to, to warm you up, because I feel that you're digesting your croissant. So how about what? Okay, so here you have the the the, the x the the, opera, the the set is just strings. And I will help you, I will tell you that the, the, the operation here will define it as concatenation. So if I write x, y, and x is a and y is b, then the result is a, b. All right? So what could be uh, identity element? What could be the one here? So what can be a string of elements in such a way that when I concatenate one with a, let's say, then I get a. And if I replace A with any string, then I will still get A. Any volunteers? <laughs> the empty string, exactly. So, so once again, if we already multiply things with something, basically, the, 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 not the zero, but the one, then we get exactly A, and things is, are, are, can be flipped around. So um, just to mention this example, one thing that will be useful for us is the free monoid. And the free monoid is just basically the, 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 the monoid defined exactly as it is, so with a multiplication, which is just a concatenation. And in addition, the, the, the free monoid is defined over the set of all possible concatenation of uh, strings. So you have a set originally, uh, let me write it like this. So we have a set of a certain vocabulary, let's say A, B, C. And the free monoid is just uh, the concatenation monoid, the just one we have seen. And uh, if we, so we write it star. So the free monoid is simply the one here by taking all possible concatenation of any, let me rephrase it. It's any words, finite words combined with this element. So A, B, C would be one element of, of this one. A, B, C. A, 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 A is one element of this thing. A, B, C, C, and so on, all other elements. So the, the, the free monoid will be useful to define basically the, the, the set we are able to work in. So the, the graph that we'll be dealing with are carrying weights and labels, and this free monoid will ask us to define what is the, the space of possibilities for our labels. So here, this very small example of, of uh, Julia here, just to give you a little bit how the, the look and feel of the, of the, of the toolkit. So here it's how you define a, a, a free monoid. So you, you will just define a new tab. So it's a pretty much a C structure. Oh, sorry, there is a question. Uh, I should, the main obstacle is Windows right now. Good. All right. I also forgot, um, I may not see you or anything, so feel free to, to know if you have questions to interrupt me anytime and also to, to shout if I don't uh, notify you. 
Um, so, so, so this is how you would implement things. So it's just about like operation overloading, and uh, and that's it. So the thing I want to point out uh, from this example is base one. So base is just a standard library of of of, um, of Julia here. The the, diff the the something which is a little bit uh, unfrequent is the, the the standard library has defined operation which is one and operation which is zero for all its type actually. So in a sense, you can um, other packages will also be using this function. So you can define summering free monoid or you can define this new numbers, as long as you give them an implementation of what is your zero, most of the Julia package can work with arbitrary summering or monoid or, or whatever operation. So this is one thing which is kind of uh, a little bit uh, new to the, to the um, or let's say not so common in, in the realm of languages. Um, just again to, to warm up, um, the, there is also the notion of morphism, so basically applying transformation, something we often want to do on all number. And the notion here is just, it's very simple, it's the notion of morphism, of, of transformation, let's say, so of one monoid and, and, and the other monoid. And the main uh, idea is when you transform uh, your, set of your, your set of elements, you're making the transformation, transformation in such a way that the order, the order of the operation will be preserved, may maybe in a different operation. So for instance, if you have two monoid, let's say uh, M and M pride, and you apply a morphism, so a function to elements in the monoid, so you have two rules, basically, the, when you map the element, the neutral element of one monoid and you map move to the, um, you need to transform it to the neutral element of the other semi rings. that's the first rule on your uh, function. And the other rules to, to be a proper uh, uh, monoid, uh, morphism, sorry, is that if you carry a sequence of operation, let's say x multiplied by y, then the you can also compute the same result with um, with a morphism of x multiplied by uh, sorry uh, multiplied by in the second semi ring so different operation by the transform value of y. The once again it's, it's very simple so don't don't get stressed about this one. It's just like applying a transformation and making sure that the transformation of your variable. Uh, will basically turn out into, uh, will be decomposable, decomposable in the same way as the input was. The point of, mono of morphism are very important for us because in many cases there are some operations that are much cheaper to perform in one domain or the other. And choosing carefully in which domain we will be computing our stuff is as a, a lot of value. Um, maybe I need to be careful with the time here. We, uh, we have a, when do we have a break? Uh, ah, sorry? At 1020. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, once again, uh, and just to to warm up a little bit. So we we started with a freemonoid. What could be a possible morphism? Meaning, like if I have a um, if I have a, um, a freemonoid. So so string. Uh, basically, the M is a set of string, and we have the multiplication here. So it's multiplication means concatenation. Uh, could you give me one monoid, one morphism? I'm sorry. in such a way that I have mu of x times y is equal to mu of x uh, something else, I will call it plus, mu times y. So any idea on this one? Uh, sorry? Exactly, you're looking for a function here you are asking for two things: a function that will transform x, any element actually of the of the of the set, but your function has to ref uh, has to respect two properties. It has to respect that when I take the neutral element of uh, let's say the empty string for this one, it has to transform into a, a, a neutral element of another monoid. And when you do mu, mu of x1 times x2, then you have to to need to have the, the you can basically intervene the operation. Having mu of x1, operation of the semi ring, of the uh, manager, monoid, and transformation of x2. Go ahead. Logarithm on strings. <laughs> I mean, if you define the operation, it's probably doable, but. <laughs> How about rotation of the symbols? So mapping a to b, b to c, c to a? A to B, I think that would work. So, so basically, you would make it. Um, uh, yep, here it is. So here you would have a, uh, if you have mu a, 
you would uh, give it would give B basically exactly. and shift it. Th that could work. That could work. And but then you need to define that mu of nothing is just nothing again. Yeah. So that's that's that's, that's a completely valid uh, valid one. Uh, I, I I choose an example uh, which is a little bit different. Um, so so this one actually the the one you gave is actually. I think isomorphic because you can always revert back. So you can always do the inverse step, but it's not necessary for, for morphisms. They can actually be uh, uh, just define just a surjection. And my uh, example was you can actually take mu of your string ABC to return the number of characters in your string. So here that would give me three. And if I have a mu of nothing, I will have just zero. And then the monoid defined by this is just a natural, uh, natural numbers. So once again, you, you, with this notion of morphism, you can actually not simply transform your number, so, so the, the modification of the string is perfectly valid, but you can also think about converting from one num definition of numbers to another definition of numbers. All right, so uh, I think enough with monoid because they are a little bit too simple. Let's ramp up a little bit in, um, in uh, interesting things, and let's go for mono simmering. So summering is nothing less than just two monoids. And then we'll see the one with three, four, no, I'm kidding. So just uh, two monoids. But the two monoids need to interact a little bit uh, uh, together. So the first one, the one that we we'll call addition, and once again, it's not the natural addition, it's just a definition, the operation that we call addition. So this operation, uh, this monoid has to be commutative, meaning that X operation Y is the same as Y operation of Y operation on X, and the other operation is uh, also monoid, which is not necessarily um, uh, commutative, and it's uh, we call it multiplication. And once again, it's not necessarily the natural uh, multiplication, just some kind of multiplication. And then the two monoids will interact uh, just by the distribution distributivity. So we need to make sure that. To be a valid summering, this operation we choose has to be uh, distributive. And there is also the interaction through the neutral element of the addition. So if I multiply something with, my, uh, with the neutral element of the addition, I get zero, or this zero bar, which is again just a specific number that we, we are free to define the way we want. So, so, so the summary is really the, this is the real, uh, real deal. This is the, the, the notion of summary is really what we'll use to define the weight of our graph. The monoid that I described will describe the, the label, the, 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 the string that will be attached to the, uh, to the arcs, but the weight of our graphs will be defined with the help of, um, with a summary. Uh, there are a lot of properties, and you can you can have you have a whole zoo of simmerings, and all of them are more crazy than uh, the other. So hopefully we'll deal with relatively simple simmerings today. Uh, just um, so 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 you know, but what we call a commutative. Uh, so basically, having just the 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 first one is commutative, but it's not enough to make the simmering itself commutative. So to be said commutative, a summering has to both uh, uh, addition and multiplication has to be commutative. So just for getting a bigger picture, what we are doing is basically a contract here. So you can imagine the, the following hierarchy where we have, if I remember properly, we have a field. And field is just a, a algebraic structure. It's the same, so it's a set with operation. And for this one, there is addition or Shall I uh, do something about that? Or yeah, I'm good. So the field has addition, multiplication, division, and subtraction. So the field is just the, the, the algebraic structure you know the most because this is basically the, the, the real the, the one we are using daily. Uh, then we have ring. So ring uh, will say, well, uh, don't care, and uh, don't uh, no sorry. Uh, he said, "Don't care. We don't. We don't need the division. Or eventually, it's when we work with ring, we are not forcing ourselves to use division. And we say that the multiplication is not necessarily commutative. So x multiplied by y <coughs> is not necessarily equal to y multiplied by x. And then there is summering. that say, well, okay, uh, we add the, the subtraction here and we don't need it anymore. So, so here there is, no, there, is, there is nothing here going to the summering. So, uh, so at the end for the summering, what we have is just 
addition and multiplication and multiplication which is not necessarily commutative. So here um, we are making a contract with the algorithm we are about to design. We are saying that we'll use only these two operations and we are not making further assumption about it. And the, the, the really cool thing about uh, this approach is we are suddenly not necessarily forced to deal just with numbers, we can deal with anything. We can deal with, let's say, tuple of numbers, we can deal with strings, we can deal with sets and everything. And as long as we are sure that the operation we define on the elements of our sets satisfies the, 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 satisfies the, the, the operation I've shown before, the constraint I've shown before, we are on the safe road. Just for uh, shaping up your mind, uh, just a very, very uh, uh, natural uh, example. So the first one you may think of is just uh, the real number. The real number, the real number, they are a field. They, they form a field because they have addition, multiplication, all uh, everything. They are a ring and they are also a semi ring. So you can think of a set where you have semi ring. Then you have a smaller set which is ring and then the smaller set, which is a field. So, of course, any field is also a semi-ring, but most of the semi-ring are actually not field. All right, so, so probability semi-ring is uh, probably um, uh, one which you are most familiar with. Maybe one that you have heard a lot is probably the log semi-ring. Um, do you see? Uh, and just but be careful here, I will define with a constant with uh, this alpha parameter. So it's not just the log semi ring, it's also the semi ring with some parameter A, where the, the addition operation is defined by first multiplying x and y by A, taking exponential of these guys, summing them, taking logarithm, and dividing the result by A. So uh, I think this is a very classical operation, so I, I won't enter maybe too much in the details here, but there is, um, you can also s look a little bit, or maybe let's make uh, some interruption here, regarding the Julia uh, features here. Julia, and this is something that you don't see uh, everywhere as a very rich uh, features of parametric type here. So here, just to give you a little bit the syntax, so I'm defining again a structure, the same I did with the monoid, and this time I know that my structure will be using a different uh, programming type. So here it can be a float32, float64, integer, whatever. So here I'm making a type which has parameters, and the parameter can be another type, but it can also be a, a constant. So here A can be a real value. And just by doing this, I'm just not defining one time here, but I'm defining a whole family of type. And for all this family of time, I'm defining some function, and this function will depend on the parameters that I have in my type. So this is a very cool feature of Julia, because this structure, this innocent structure, can be trivially sent to a GPU to run, to be parallelized and everything. So here I'm not making things complicated. I'm just defining a type. And the semantic of Julia allo allows you to define very rich family of type that can be considered as number by most of the algorithm. So, um, once again, uh, going through the whole morphism story, um, we can extend the notion of morphism to semi ring. So, here's a, I'll, I'll go a little bit faster because the story is exactly the same. We just need to make sure that the morphism, the function, will map the neutral element of the addition to the neutral addition of the second semi ring. Same thing with the neutral element of the multiplication. And for the, the morphism, will respect the, 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 the order of the operation for the addition and the multiplication. So it's pretty much the same as the monoid, except that now we have two monoids, so we need to make sure that all the constraints are satisfied. So just to, to give an example here, uh, we have the function, which is 1 over a log of x, which basically takes the probability summary ring, apply transformation on the element, and give us uh, the log summary ring, element from the log summary ring. Uh, this is an isomorphism, uh, isomorphism, I've, sorry, I pardon my French. And um, uh, so this is a pretty much a, a, a common thing. The reason I want to mention this relation between probability and log semi ring is once again, there is a reason why we want, uh, sorry for jumping. So there is a reason why we want to do it. So for instance, if I do consider the, the following computation where I have um, a bunch of numbers that represent probabilities, let's say uh, x1, uh, <coughs> So 
So I have x1 multiplied by x2 multiplied by x3. And consider that we're going to do a, a multiplication here uh, that has um, a, a high, number of, uh, high number of elements, x4, x, uh, I don't know, k. And each k is, each x is actually between 0 and 1. So it's probably represent probability, and you're trying to ca compute the probability of something of many variables just by taking the multiplication of all of them. The fact is, from a numerical perspective, if you try to do this on a computer belong k greater than 100 or 1,000, it will fail miserably because you will go under the precision of the computer. So here the whole idea of morphism is to be able to carry on the same computation, uh, but in a more stable way. So if you apply this operation of from the probability summering to the log summering, so mu of this guy will be mu is defined by 1 a over log of x, then um, we'll have uh, basically so we can all define the same operation, mu x1, and here it will multiplication of the log summering, mu x2, and so on and so forth. And this time, because we are directly on the log summering, uh, the numerical is the, numer the computation is stable because we are in the logarithmic range. So once again, this is, I understand it's a little bit of a trivial example here, but I, I really want to stress this out that there is a value of this idea of morphism that in many cases, we want to make sure that the order of the operation matters and some computations that are sometimes untractable for many practical reasons can actually be cast to a different type of problems through morphism or isomorphism yeah. and eventually give uh, uh, the same solution up to a transformation. Luca? I had a question. Sure. Can you go back to the green box above this one? So I was trying to make sure I follow your notation, and it went by a little fast for me. Now keep going further. Uh, where you had the log semi-rank defined. Uh, Logarithmic. You log, uh, it's probably here in the uh, center. Yeah, that's, there you go. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I follow that. So you say the log semi-rank is, let's see, r union minus infinity. That's the set. Yeah. Then there is one thing, then there's another thing, a third and fourth thing. So let's unpack that. So the first thing which says, if I have x and y, then I take e to the ax plus e to the ay and then take the log of that divided by a. That is my addition operation in the ring? It's like so, the so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so plus will mean not plus, plus will mean something. Exactly, exactly. So, so uh, trying to, yeah. just correct me if I got it wrong, but basically x plus y, we again, yeah. taking x to be real numbers, um, then it's going to be log yeah. of exponential of a times x plus right. exponential of a times y. So I'm dealing with real numbers, but you've just redefined it for me. You say, when you say add them, it means exponentiate them, add the things, and then take the log again, everything scaled by a. And exactly. then the next symbol plus, actually that's multiplication. Yeah, that means yeah, yeah. that when you say, Sanjeev, multiply x and y, what you really mean, mean is add them up, because that's a new definition of multiply. Exactly. Okay, and then what is minus infinity? It's the identity of... Um, but then maybe can, uh, someone can guess, actually. So why is a minus infinity here? Uh, I, I, wh what meaning does it carry? So, hmm. so what happens if I plug, uh, let's say, y is any number, let's say y is 1, and uh, I have minus infinity here. What's will, what will happen? Sorry, I, I heard some mumble. It will give 0? Uh, it will give 0 where? The result of the operation? The result will be zero or zero. It will be the one divided by a log e a x. Log x, exactly. So if we simplify this one, a log exponential of a x, sorry. And that just a x divided by a, and that's just x. And, and once again, so so maybe to answer uh, Sanjeev's question, the point is like this is this uh, what I call zero bar or zero for short is just a number, one element of the set that has no effect when I use addition. 
And and uh, so uh, Sanjeev is is is, um, is right. It, I understand it may seem trivial, but it's not. Like there is a lot. It's very easy to get confused because what we call multiplication and what we call addition are not the common operator we are defining. We are, let's say, defining operation. And with the, way, the reason we call them multiplication is because they are they are certain basically uh, uh, properties, uh, commutative, uh, the associativity, and the addition is addition multiplication is just because there is a notion of distribution. But we are not actually multi uh, multiplying or actually adding or using the natural multiplication multiplication or natural addition because it's, it depends on the number we are defining. If x are strings, for instance, x and y are strings, then the, the natural addition and natural multiplication have, have no real meaning. Of course. Isn't, that min isn't the minus infinity uh, actually a problem in addition? Because whenever I add minus infinity to anything, it's going to be minus infinity, right? Ah, yeah. Yeah, okay. so, so addition, uh, so, so it's, it's probably good to make a, another example. Remember that we say that our multiplication to be defined is x uh, something, let's say call it a, um, sorry. a multiplied by uh, 0 will be 0. So actually you, you made it yourself. So minus infinity plus natural addition plus uh, uh, something will always be minus infinity. So we have the, the property that a, mm, let's say, multiplied by zero is actually equal to zero. So 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 that my uh, my addition is my multiplication. Orange is a new black, right? So any since we are making a break here, uh, um, do we have any more questions? Or some people are feeling a little bit confused. You just have to keep track of what you're doing because add means this funny thing now, multiply means add, zero means minus infinity, one means zero, and I don't know. I it want to say welcome to France, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So belong this, um, in most of the case, we are making this abstraction uh, in such a way to, to actually not think about the operation we are defined. We are just, as I told you, made a contract that will have some operation that has some properties, and then we don't really care. So, so right now I'm giving concrete example, but we can hopefully soon forget about them because we know the properties and we know that there will be, our algorithm will be defined for all family. I want to uh, uh, finish on this section by, by introducing the last uh, summary ring that as probably most of you have known before is the tropical summary ring. Um, the way I define it would be actually the Arctic summary ring, but that's, uh, um, that's not very relevant. So, so let's take the addition of our, the addition of our log summary ring. So remember I decided that x plus something is defined by this operation. And what would be concerning is concern is uh, what happens if I start to play with the a and uh, I push it to the limit, right? I go a going bigger, 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 bigger till infinity. So uh, here the interesting part is like the, the logarithm can be bended. This operation can be easily bended. So so if you, if you want to know where the this uh, bending is coming from, just rewrite your uh, function in terms of max of x y and mean of x y. So I let you do the math. And so it can be bounded by uh, max of x and y on the left side and max of x and y on the right side plus something, which is a constant that does not depend on y. And if we make alpha bigger, 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 since you know that here this 1 over a will actually divide the, 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 the constant here, so the constant will become smaller, 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 smaller. So you have... Um, you have the, the, the function here, let's call it 1a uh, uh, log of eax plus eay. So it's a very uh, weird schematic, but I have some upper band, and I have a, a um, upper band, lower band. And when I actually increase a, I'm actually making the band tighter and tighter. And if I go again a higher, I'll just make the, band, the upper band and the lower band tighter and tighter. So the, the old story here that I want to notice is like when I take a super, super big, like infinity, actually the, the, there is a, the, the logarithm is not anymore logarithm, we simply apply the max function. So that's a little bit strange. But this is very interesting to us because 
the, the max function still follows the property of the addition as we have defined it. So in a sense that uh, we have x plus, uh, so let me write it down to make things clear. So if I write x plus y is equal to x max of x, y, then uh, I know that uh, this is commutative. I know that if I use the, 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 the multiplication defined by x plus y is x natural addition y, I know that this, uh, these two will distribute. So all basi basically all the, 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 the wheels are, are fitting together. And just using this max operation, we can define again a, tr uh, a semi ring where the addition is exactly like the log semi ring, but the addition is defined as a maximum. So this semi ring, we call it the tropical semi ring. So why I mentioned, I mentioned this one is if we, let's say that we are interested in computing the, the, the a sequence of probability, like we are using probability of x and y, x and, y and we are using uh, the log summary, the log of p of x and y, and we can decompose our probability into basically a, a operation, and that will be carried out with a log summary. If I do the same thing, if I so, so basically I will have, I don't know, a log of log of p x one uh, just let me make one variable to for simplicity multiply by p of x2 uh, x1 and so on and so forth so this is just like if i look in the probability domain i mean the probabilistic summering if i apply the log morphism i mean the log summering and if i consider this modify this deformed log summering by playing these a parameters i will end up with a, a max of p x1 and p x2, x1, and so on and so forth. And this will give me the most, the maximum probability of the event. So um, here I'm making the story a little bit more confusing than it has to be. So, so the, the, the short message here is like, when you really scale this A constant and you go to the tropical summary, you're son, suddenly not using logarithm but maximum. And therefore, you're not computing, a s uh, you're, you're computing something a little bit different. And this difference is what we'll use in your decoder. So to make a, a very like um, simplification, when we do training with sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence learning, we are using usually a uh, log summering, some operation defining some probability or uh, operation on probabilities. And when we are doing decoding, we are using a different set of operations that will be actually the tropical summering using the max property. So from these standpoints, you can actually think uh, problems for inference, for training and for inference as the same problem, just up to the switch of summering. So you can define your algorithm, and you set your summering to the log summering, your training. If you set your summering to tropical summering, your decoding. So once again, that's the, 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 the nicety of this abstraction. It separates the algorithm from the meaning of what you're doing. Of course, of course. And uh, from uh, where is this uh, logarithm to 1 uh, over a ln 2 in the second term? Just uh, you say you bound it from left and right, so... Yeah. Where, where, where is the bound coming from? Where, where, uh, where are you asking where, is, uh, where are the bounds coming from? Yeah, like where is the constant coming from this ln 2? Uh, it's, it's coming from Wikipedia. But but we can verify nice. it. <laughs> we, we, we can we can we can verify it relatively easily. The, um, you're asking about the left or the, the right one? Like both. <laughs> okay. Uh, so so let's see whether we can derive the, the um, derive it yourself. So so what actually we'll do is something we we actually which has very uh, which is very important when you run optimized code because this is how truly are implementing your logarithm function when you call your programming language. So if you're doing something like, I need to find some that works. For simplicity, we, we forget about the a in this example, we just consider x and y. So we have ax plus exponential of y. 
And uh, um, if you do this naturally, then you will quickly run, just imagine you're using computer here, you will quickly run under precision. If X and Y are big or any of them is very big, then your precision is going to be terrible and you will get not a number. So maybe what you want to do is something a little bit uh, smarter and you can say, okay, I, have, I will make a big M, I will define it max of X, Y. And little m, which is mean of x, y. Okay? We forget when x and y are equal. Nobody cares. So we can rewrite here. So, so basically, I would have uh, a mapping, uh, max, big M, little m. And I can basically rewrite this guy as log of exponential of big M. And no, I need to think. So it's going to be exponential of... Uh, let's say minus m. Uh, Luca, can I suggest a... I think I see how this goes. So maybe mm -hmm. I'll just suggest something. So if you just write x plus y, right, it's bounded below by max of x, y. So it's... Le no, it's below. So on the left side, say it's bigger than or equal to... In other words, x plus y is bigger than the bigger of the two, right? So it's the lower bound is max x, y. No, 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 just write x plus y is bounded below by max of x, y, and bounded above by 2 times max of x, y. Now you take logs everywhere and you get that inequality. Uh, you consider that uh, x and y are positive? Yeah, yeah, all non-negative, yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's not true, is it? No, no, because you're exponentiating. So you're exponentiating, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So, so that, that's one way. I, uh, did you follow or...? Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, the, the, the route I was taking is basically to factorize it, and at the end you, you, you end up the same, but basically you will, uh, you will end up having exponential of zero plus exponential of little m, right? If you multiply, you have exponential of max plus exponential of uh, max plus m, uh, something is probably fishy here. But loosely speaking, the idea is here, you will factorize by the max one. This one is basically, now you can get max plus log of exponential of zero of one plus something. Let's say something. And uh, the bound, you can derive exactly the same bound using this route in a more complicated way. And remember, we are in France, so we like the detour. Did I answer loosely your question? Okay, so finally we make it, that was probably the most boring part of the presentation. Now we are entering the fun, the finite state automata. I, I really wanted to take the, the, this time with uh, numbers, uh, with to generalize the numbers, because it really is the, 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 the heart of a uh, weighted finite state automata or transducer. It's really this generation of numbers, the fact that we'll be ex able to express algorithm on a family of or, or, or loose defined uh, definition of numbers. Um, now we'll enter with a weighted finished state automata, and here I, I just uh, uh, um, a warning that I, I won't be very cautious about the, tr the definition between automata, transducer, acceptor. Um, I do it a little bit uh, voluntarily because I don't want to, to get too much into the data. There is a difference, but for us we'll kind of sometimes define it, sometimes not define it too much. Uh, the first thing that uh, uh, to properly to, to the rigorous definition of uh, automata is basically a, a, a tuple. It's a, it's a algebra, uh, once again, it's a structure, and he has a, a set of alphabet, that a set of symbols that we we'll call lambda. He has a set of state. He has some initial, final state. I mean, I can go over all the the, the bullets point here, but it's a little bit uh, not very digest. So, so let's. Uh, uh, Walk through some example if I manage to get there. Yeah. So basically, he has a set of symbols, and here my symbol will be beer and wine. So I have only two symbols, and I have four states, meaning I have can f my machine can be in uh, four different uh, my abstract machine, my my computation model can be in four different uh, position. I can start a computation only from the state number one, and I can end a computation only in states three and four. And then we have this alpha mapping, which define it's just basically r repeating the notion of initial and final state, but giving weight. So here is just say, okay, 
let's say, the score or the probability or the, the weight attributed to starting a computation in state one is one, so one bar, very simple. Uh, and all the rest are zero, so basically uh, we say that the state is initial, it can initiate a computation if uh, when, when the its initial, initial weight is different from zero. And the same thing goes with the final transition, uh, the, the final state. So basically there is a cost, a weight associated at starting a computation from a state, and there is a cost, a weight associated to ending a computation in some state. And then there are transition defining, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten in my set there is a the French fry is missing. So there is a transition, basically, a transition is just a pair of states, a source state, a destination state, a weight, which belongs to mirroring, and that's the whole point we have been working on mirroring, is just to, to get rid of this, like, uh, uh, abs to, 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 to have an abstraction to work on whatever numbers we want, and also a label, and label is, again, any element of the, of the, of the, of the set here. I mean, my apologies, I forgot uh, one symbol. So, of course, here's this, this representation or this, uh, this uh, enumeration of set state is probably a little bit um, uh, difficult to, to, to bear with, Oh, fortunately, we have a representation of graph, and this is mostly what we'll be working with. So states are this uh, little bubble, and we can the, the, the bold one marks a state that is initial, meaning that we can initiate a computation on this, on this automata. And meaning a computation here, I will define pr more precisely, but basically just imagine a run going from one state to the other following the, the edge. And the edge, the arcs, are carrying two important things for us the a symbol, which we'll call it the label, and a weight, which belongs to a summary ring. Um, importantly, there is a special symbol that we call the epsilon, and this is an empty string. So, so basically, the, the alphabet of sequences that are defined by my, uh, my uh, graph is defined in the free monad of label, so you remember this set of all possible sequences. And this uh, represents a neutral element of this monoid, so it's just basically telling it's just nothing. It's, it's, uh, it takes a weight, it adds a weight to the computation, but it doesn't produce or consume any symbols. Uh, so here it defines a typical pattern of, uh, of uh, evening, so we, we just, uh, let's say, just to understand the, the way we, we need to interpret this, uh, this type of uh, representation. So once again, we start from a state, then we go to uh, an, uh, another state following the transition. So here it will start by uh, eating some fries. And then from state two, you have two choices. Either you go to uh, drink beer or to drink wine. And one in your state three and four, you can continue to drink beer or continue to drink wine, but you can never go back. You remember that the graph is actually directed, so you cannot travel back to past. And at some point, there is some ending here. So, so the double edge uh, uh, circle represents um, um, a possibility in this state to stop. And there is a weight associated to stopping, which will be defined here by 0, 2 for state 3. I mean, it's just an example, obviously, but 0, 4 for state 4. And once again, this weight belongs to a summary. So in short, Weighted finite state automata or transducer are more or less a uh, graph with some labels and weights as associated to the, to, to the transition. There are, this is just one definition. You can define it sometimes differently, but just so I'm just mentioning in, uh, that you can also consider that the, the, the labels, you can consider it as part of the weight because you have the possibility to think of the of the label as a as a generalized generalized number or element of a semi ring, so you can also consider the not make distinction between label and weight. It can just be the same element. Uh, I'm s okay. Sorry, I got uh, carried away. All right. So now we'll define a few uh, elements. Um, we just define a few elements um, over uh, a finite state transducer uh, that will be necessary for the rest. So, so the first is the notion of path, which is, as you might expect, just a sequence of transition here. So a path is just, I will just go over uh, one state, go to another state following a transition, so I'm, and then go from the other state going to the next state following a transition, and if I concatenate all these transitions together, I have a path, right? So this is typical, uh, a typical graph, uh, 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 um, graph uh, concept. 
so here this is more or less just notation. So we have the notion of what is uh, the, the origin of the origin of the path. We'll write it p. So here, if I just follow the blue lines, the origin is state one. Then there is uh, what we call the next element, the destination of the path, so that the final state reached by the path, so that will be state four. And more importantly, there is a label of the path. So the label of the path will simply be all the elements, the labels multiplied together, so concatenated together. And very importantly, the weight of the path will simply be the weight of all the arcs multiplied in the summering sense together. So a path in a weighted automata has a label. It defines a word, basically a sequence of, of a finite sequence of um, of, uh, of labels, and it has a weight associated. So another way of representing WFST is simply that the, this type of machine actually they define a set of labels, LK, and for each label they define a, a, a specific weight. Or let me write it in this way. So we have, uh, let's say, AA, which has, I don't know, a, a weight of uh, uh, whatever, two. I have A, B, C, it has a weight of three, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine that you have uh, every transducer, every automata you define, it takes a weight of a load sequences, and for each of them it will give a label. The fact is, if you start to, let's consider the, all the weight possible uh, forming in a language. So I am uh, Lucas, I am French, uh, you know, all possible sentences you can make, and you can attribute them a score. But if you do this, it's going to be insane because your amount of sentences you can make is extremely big, assuming it's finite. And what is interesting with this framework is like it kind of factorizes the computation. So you see that the, if you, you have different paths defining different labels, but some of these paths can have shared transitions. So in a sense, it's a weighted finite state automata define sets of sequences assigned with weights, but it encodes them in a very efficient manner. So let me, I think it's almost time for the break, just 10 minutes. So let me just finish with this one. And then we'll, for the second part, we'll jump for the linear algebra perspective. Uh, then I want to make a slight, uh, um, a slight um, uh, nuance. Basically, I mentioned about pass. Pass is very, it's very much a graph concept. Graph, a pass is simply a sequence of transition. The fundamental difference between a, um, a graph and a weight it's, uh, and a WFST or, uh, is, is simply the notion of computation. So computation is nothing more than a, than a pass, but you will multiply it by the weight of the initial state, and you will multiply from the left side, and you will multiply with, um, uh, on from the right with the, with the weight of the final state. So loosely speaking, if I m move back to my presentation here, to this example, the, this is the path. The path is simply the transition of arcs, but the computation is the same thing, but multiplied by what is the weight associated to this state. So here is just one, and the weight multiplied here on this one. So it, it's very subtle difference and a little bit uh, maybe pedantic, but it's really the, the, the border here between graph and weighted, uh, 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 weighted automata is the weighted automata define a more uh, a fine grain definition of set of sequences. All right, so that's uh, we know the other concepts. So, uh, um, so the other concepts we'll need is just like um, it's more or less what I was saying that you can just consider uh, uh, any words in a, a set of uh, of symbols, and uh, this word will be attributed a weight, and the way we attribute the weight is by computing all computation. So pass with initial and final weight that correspond to the label of this word. So for instance, here I have, um, I don't have multiple paths. So, yeah, so here it's not very easy example. So, so simply, the what I write A of X is simply like telling, okay, for the X, which is AA, I return to, and this is what my, uh, my automata is defining. Uh, and finally, and let me mention this one, um, the notion of transducer. So, so far I lose, I intentionally use acceptor or automata and transductor. There is actually a, a, a difference. 
The differences between the label. In uh, acceptor automata, labels are just a single label, whereas for transducer, they define rules of transduction. So instead of having uh, AA, as in a, for, for a acceptor, we'll have, a, let's say, a rule telling that when you have A, you will make it to X or uh, another symbol. So here, I think the example is uh, relatively uh, straightforward. It defines uh, uh, input some basically uh, uh, habits of, let's say, or or action, uh, eating, drinking, and we can map this action into a set of, let's say, consequences of uh, either sleeping after drinking wine or uh, eventually getting sick if I mix beer and wine. So you get two things. You get a lecture on a weighted finished state transducer and also some good advice for life. So. That's for free. So I think we are almost there, or we are there. Maybe we can take a break now. And if you have a yeah, question, please. And the mic is coming. I'm sorry, but I think like you cannot end up happy when <laughs> you are drinking beer. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a terrible uh, guilt. So. <laughs> I'm sure during the exercise you will be able to fix uh, this uh, pr obvious uh, problem. Any any other question? I think there's a simple fix. You just make four a final state. Uh, well, that's a dangerous. That's a dangerous one. Any any question? Yeah. The transition and acceptor. Yes, please. Yeah, so so here, uh, this notation, you have like uh, something as input, so let's say the fries, and something as output is a neutral phase here. So the way you need to interpret it is, I will give you, so, so it's, not a, it's not anymore a, a, a set of sequences and the weights associated, it's a function. So now you have uh, this automata define a function with some inputs, and here x will take X will take values as a, a, sec a combination of fries, wine, and beer. This is the vocabulary of the input. And this function will associate some Y, and Y will be a string um, defined on the set of symbols of this face, like happy, smiling, or, or sick. You understand? So, so it defines uh, yeah, some input alphabet, output alphabet, and the, the transducer defines a function, just not a weighted set. And of course, the, the, tr the, the, the association is also weighted. Right, and it's dependent on the previous uh, states as well. It depends on the, the the so yeah, it's 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 still the same like uh, uh, automata, like memoryless automata. So it just depends on the previous state. Okay. It depends on the the rules you define of transduction. Okay. Coffee. So, so I don't know how long is your. Uh, so there is another question. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so we will be able to define a structure like this using the Julia programming language. Uh, yeah, you probably do it yourself this afternoon. So uh, there is also open FST. Uh, yes. So, so right now I I, I didn't. Uh, so, so 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 far there was nothing interesting. Like it was just the past. So this has been known for ages and everything. And and uh, you're right to mention like open FST is just like probably the best toolkit to do that ever. Um, things will get interesting probably just after. We'll start to do things in a little bit differently uh, than OpenFST. So op OpenFST will store the, um, the, 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 this structure pretty much like a graph. I mean, it will just store it, but the interesting thing is like when you will do the algorithm of computation. Let's say that you're looking for the, the best pass, whatever is your definition of best pass, you're looking for some specific in a graph, or you want to modify your FST. Uh, in some way, you want to add or remove something. You will basically have typical, let's say, what I call typical graph algorithm. You will use maybe a queue of stacking states to visit. You will do algorithm like breadth first search, depth first search, and everything. Uh, these algorithm are somewhat difficult to map to the to 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 to, to GPU. I mean, it's you need to take it with a little bit of grain of salt. There are two things. You can map this algorithm on GPU. But then I make a whole speech about summary ring. We, you probably want to have this uh, element to run on summary ring. And it's usually very hard to combine both worlds, to have your algorithm performant for all possible summary rings. So that's basically this restraint. So, so OpenFST is great, but it has the difficulty of 
scaling up with the modern uh, um, um, with a modern uh, constraint of computation. I'm talking about GPU training, but you can also take the opposite. What happens if you have a, you want your ASR to run on cell phone? You also need some special like uh, uh, way of making things very fast, and it has also some parallelism. So, so in the rest of this presentation, we'll try to start to see how to implement maybe concretely, and in a different, we'll take a different one than OpenFST. Okay, so, so if there is no uh, other question, I suggest we have a break now. I don't know how long is the break, 10 minutes, something like this? And then at, uh, so what time is it? Uh, it's, okay, so 10, 30, 35, let's get back here and, and to finish.
going from state one to, I mean, this is here just the identifier. So this arc is ending in state two. So it was starting from state one with a weight of zero five, and it arrives in state two. There is a question. I was going to ask, so in the first matrix, you put the weight of on the arc on the source state, right? The other entries which you haven't shown, are they going to be the semi zero? Is that what you mean by leaving uh, them empty? Yes, yes. So, because so here, for, yeah. for uh, unclutter notation, I didn't show up the, the zero, but when you have a blank space, it's a semi ring zero. And that, that notion will be important. The fact that already look at, uh, we have a simple matrix and most of it is zero. And I also draw your attention on that by this construction, uh, since a s arc can have only one source and one destination, we already know that the colon, every colon will have a single element, the single non-zero element, sorry. And, and once again, uh, it's here it's, it's, it's just not the only way. You can also represent your, your, your FST as a 3D tensor. The reason I didn't went that way, it's, I found it was adding a little bit of complexity to think in 3D, and, and that's it. But uh, we could really definite, de define the same thing in a, in a different uh, uh, tensorial structure. So, so far, uh, this is an example here. So the, 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 these two metrics, source and estimation, will define all the edge of my FST. It didn't encode the label, and that's another thing important. We are really separating the labels uh, from the tensor structure. But may I ask about the uh, tables? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I understand from the tables that it, it encodes the uh, like the input uh, state, the target state, the probability, but the the beer, the food, the wine, is not like represented in no. these two metrics. No, here we we need so so here I didn't do it in this map. Actually, there will be um, uh, another vector. So we need to to index them. So you need to, to, to find, uh, uh, the order doesn't matter, but we need to say, okay, one, two, fries, and zero, five will be mapped to index one. Then uh, uh, one, two, epsilon, zero, five will be mapped to index two. So you need to find, uh, uh, we, we, we basically, the, 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 so, so this matrix only encodes the weight, nothing else, okay? Um, so here, the, the, uh, we need another vector to encode the, the final states, and this is relatively easily to, easy to understand. So we'll again take a vector which is defined as uh, which has as many dimensions as states, and uh, non-zero elements, with meaning that uh, the state number, let's say, three here, will have a, a, a fi uh, is a final weight because he has a non-zero weight, and the weight is zero two. And once again, the weight here is a summary ring; it can be anything you want. And finally, and that completes uh, the question, we need to encode the label. And this label will be encoded as a single like uh, array. So here, there is no need to consider it as a vector. It's just a list telling that this is a mapping. It's an index, basically. It's telling that uh, element, the edge one, uh, as label uh, fries. And, and notice that you can have several labels having the, the, um, the same labels, but we need to encode them differently. Uh, at the different indes indices. So that's the representation we'll, uh, we'll choose. And once again, I want to stress that there are different uh, representation, but all of them tend to have uh, the similar properties. So right away, we can already think a little bit about like uh, uh, the, the obvious problem of these approaches. So uh, let me hide the... Uh, how defining on this, so, so remember, we have uh, a S matrix here, which is de defined over Q, the number of states and number of arcs. Um, what will be the, how much memory, as assuming that I need to store every element here, zero and non-zero, what will be the, the, the memory I need in the worst case? If I give you that I have um, Q states and I tell you that my alphabet has a, a certain number, so these are fixed, what would be the amount of memory I would need for this one? Do you, have, do you guys have any, any idea? They were, yeah, uh, good. Uh, I guess Q squared times uh, the cardinal of the thing. Uh, Q squared by the cardinal of this one. Why Q squared? And I s Q squared because it could, could go from any state to, to any, any state. states. And times. the cardinal, yeah, that's the one. So, so basically in the worst case, 
uh, you will have from between uh, two states, you can have connection from one to two, assuming you have only two states. So that's number of states. Uh, and you need to have any label. So if you have your label, you have A, B, that's your all possible label. You have one arcs going to two with label A, one arcs going to two with label B, and one arcs going to from two to one with label A, and one arcs going to one with label B. So uh, this is exactly what I was showing here, and uh, and yes, and in total, the so the number of arcs basically is Q square e. So this is what you say, but then we need to so basically what you define uh, Sala is only the number of arcs you will have at most, but it remains actually this dimension. So you have you need to multiply another times by Q, and we end up having a complexity, a memory complexity with Q cube multiply by the number of, uh, uh, not ages, I'm sorry, this is a typo, the number of, of elements in your alphabet. No, I prefer to be honest with you, Q cube is kind of bad. Uh, you don't want to do that in practice because if, once again, in speech recognition, if we have uh, 200,000 states or maybe even like 50,000 states, uh, cubing is, uh, is going to be a big number. So the whole point here is like we definitely need to find a solution to um, to store things efficiently, and this is where we are going to to work on sparse array. So here is the notion of um, of sparse, oh sorry, of, of a, a linear algebra related to to WFST is only theoretically it's fine. You can definitely theoretically you can define it the way you want, but practically you cannot work on this problem without working on the arc space of sparsity. How are you going to handle these uh, big matrices that are mostly filled with zero? And you need to come up with a solution which is practical to make computation efficient. So here we'll discuss a little bit about sparse arrays. And uh, uh, just to give you a little bit like the, the, the basic thinking of how you can, it can look like in the code when you're working in this, uh, from this perspective. So first of all, a definition, like what we call sparse, is you have an array, it has whatever shape you want, it's a vector, matrix, tensor, doesn't matter, but we we'll consider the, the majority of its element are zero. So there is the notion of sparse, it's, it's a little bit uh, ambiguous, you will, there is not a fixed threshold, but basically most of its elements will be zero, and you want to avoid to have to store all the unused, uh, useless values uh, together. So for vectors, it is very simple. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, the vector here, you have uh, uh, the index 3 and 4 that are the, the, the carrying the, 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 the proper values. Well, if you want to be smart, probably you want to simply store the element in your vector uh, when, um, when they are non-zero, and then you simply store the non-zero values. So for on my little example, it's a little bit ridiculous because we end up having storing two for four elements, exactly the same number, but now imagine that x is a 10,000 dimensional vector, it has two elements, then you own uh, two non-zero elements, sorry. Then you need to have only four uh, values stored in memory. So using the concept of sparsity, you can really work on extremely big uh, arrays as long as the, the number of non-zero value are, uh, is fine. And here, the zero that I'm mentioning here is a summering zero. So once again, we think of the concept of sparsity within the summering framework, and the zero can be anything, depending on the summary. Um, so, so, well, here this is just an example. Uh, in Julia, for instance, if you want to, to work uh, to define your own uh, type, let's say a sparse vector, well, you need to mostly uh, 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 implement three things. So first of all, the structure, defining how you're going to, to store your elements. So this is, I think this is relatively straightforward. Here you have some index and some array of indices and array of values. And what is interesting is like, this is the only value you need to define to work with arrays with Julia, at least from a very uh, high level perspective. You need simply need to define what is the uh, dimension of your array, but you also need to define a, a proper way of getting your, your, um, your, uh, your elements. So the get index will tell, uh, you need to implement for your particular representation, how are you going to access your element? If the user wants the ice element, how are you going to retrieve it? And from this code, which is just a for loop, a very naive way of looking through the, the, the way, we can already see one thing which is coming along with a sparsity package, that we have reduced the, the vector, so now we 
maybe we have a 10,000 vector, 10,000 element vector, and we have maybe 100 of non-zero value, values, so we store 200 values where we are fine. However, to retrieve an element is not direct access. So we need to go through the hassle of looking through my indices, whether the user index he wants is actually in my, uh, in my array, and then I need to return it. So by compressing the structure, we are giving up easiness of accessing the value. So we are, it's, it's basically the same problem of all compression method. You're reducing the size of the data, but the retrieval of the data itself may become slightly more complex. So the whole point here of having sparse compression is to make sure that your sparse compression is not uh, hampering the, you, the, 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 the application you want to, to do. If you want to do vector.product, for instance, maybe there are better choices than one I, I just uh, chose. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show. Okay, now uh, we've seen the, the major, the main concept for vector, for matrix, things get a little bit more interesting. So first of all, let's go with the most easy format we can think of. For a matrix, we have, uh, for this matrix, we can do the same thing as a vector, saying we'll store one vect uh, array of indices for the columns, or the rows, sorry, and then one array of indices for the columns and one array of, of, uh, for the values. So that's the, the, you can find in the literature, the coordinate format, and sometimes you, it's abbreviated COO for NumPy, uh, PyTorch, and so on. So here, things get interesting when we start to sort our elements on rows or on columns. So here, in my example, it's sorted by rows. And we see here that because the rows are sorting, I'm, I'm guaranteed that I will have one, one, one a certain number of times, then two, 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 a certain number of times, and so on and so forth. So maybe I can get um, somehow a, a better representation that kind of compress again this array. And this works only if I sorted my values by row. If I choose a, d a different order, this doesn't apply anymore. So uh, if I sort by, or I can do the sorting by colon, obviously it's exactly the same. And if I sort by colon, or by row, sorry, here, instead of sort of sorting the, keeping the, all the array of all the colon indices, I can simply store a, a, a pointer, an array that indicate where my indices are starting. So for instance, the row pointer array here would tell me, okay, so the row number one the colon and values in this is starts at index one. And then the row number two, in your uh, colon value and value uh, and arrays of value, will start at the index two. So if you want, for instance, to retrieve all the non-zero values of your colon number one, you look at the first index of one and the last index of three and say, huh, so these are my two values. So this is a, the, the principle of compressed format, and you might have heard as compressed sparse row for CSR, and there is a, the alternative of compressed sparse colon, which is exactly the same, except that you will sort based on the colon. So everything, there is no free meal, and everything comes with some, some, some uh, pros and cons. For instance, if you consider the coordinate format, uh, it is kind of very easy to add and remove elements because you just add to your values, uh, uh, you expand your arrays with one more row, one more column, and one more value, so the addition of an element is constant. So the coordinate format is great to construct sparse arrays. When you look at memory usage, well, it's kind of neutral, it's not too bad. Uh, it can be better, but well. The problem is more like how to access the elements. So the the, the coordinate format does not have a very good or very fast uh, access to elements, and that would preclude the use of, like, if you want to use this format on GPU, you're going to have a hard time. So that's really where it's not so good at, it's uh, accessing the element, uh, uh, whether row or column, doesn't matter. The CSR format is, uh, as offer a different trade-off. Adding and removing elements, not, not, not really good, actually, because now there is an extra step, which is sorting. And therefore, when you add a new element, then you need to figure out how you're, you probably need to modify your sorting. So depend, adding an uh, element in the, a new row, for instance, is easy, but adding uh, an extra colon is probably challenging. The memory usage is slightly better, but to be honest, here's the difference between the coordinates and compresses. 
at least on FSG, is not that huge, so I wouldn't say it's a significant difference. Now, where the, the compressed sparse format is really an um, uh, 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 interesting format is because it gives a constant time access to all the non-zero elements of a row, uh, all the colon for the compressed sparse colon format. And this basically will allow us to write matrix vector multiplication for sparse elements extremely fast. And, and without this property, you, we cannot, we wouldn't benefit anything from the, um, from the linear algebra uh, framework of WFST. Uh, yes, so, so here the same story goes for the colon, uh, if we sort things. And this is, for instance, how you can access it. And once again, when you have compressed your data, the access to the data itself is more challenging. If you want to, so I was just making an example. Oh, by the way, this I will send the notebook uh, later on so you can play around yourself if you're interested. In it. So um, as a conclusion, remember that when you deal about sparsity, there is no perfect, uh, perfect solution. And you always need to consider what are your data, what will be the sparsity pattern, but maybe more importantly, what are you going to do with your data? In our case, are we going just build matrices or are we going to use matrix multiplication? And depending on what we are going to do, we'll need to cho choose the right format. So I made a question here and I, I don't have an answer actually here because this is depending on what you want to do, the, the, the structure you want to use, let's say for S and D matrices, highly varies. For instance, you will see in the code that some trivial operation may become a little bit complex to implement because the format does not really allow it. Well, on the other hand, some other applications are trivial because in this format it's just shine. As a rule of thumb, remember that coordinate format is good for adding, modifying your matrix, uh, your sparse matrix. Compressed sparse row is good when you make matrix multiplication with dense vector and sparse matrices. That works. This format is really great for this. And finally, the colon or the, the compressed sparse colon format is good when you're multiplying matrices with sparse vectors. And this is where the, the format shines. So if you find the application, remember these rules. All right, so now um, we've seen that the WFST can be encoded as uh, sparse matrices as matrices, basic vectors and matrices. And we've seen that practically, it's not just a spherical perspective, we can actually represent the, um, the, the, uh, the FST uh, uh, efficiently. I've forgotten to mention that since now we have sparse matrices, remember it's a matrix that have a cu cube uh, co space complexity, now the complexity of sparse matrices is simply the number of edges. So, that's the main reason that we can work with linear algebra for WFST is because we are actually able to use sparse patterns uh, with arbitrary summering, and therefore whatever big container we choose, technically we are not having uh, some overriding complexity. Uh, now we'll try to start to see how things look from what is the so-called rational operation. Rational operation for WFST are primary operation, let's say basic operation. And remember the problem for us, let's say if you think in terms of uh, speech recognition, the WFST, so, so the problem is to construct a, a FST or automata that will, that will represent all possible, let's say, sentences in a, in a language. And that's something enormous. And you need to, to take into account several factors. The way I pronounce it, so the word, let's say, hello, is it a uh, single pronunciation? How maybe more pronunciation? What would be the number of phone? What would be the orthography if you want to map it to, uh, to uh, some uh, words? So you see that if you want to build a FST that, is, that will take the neural network output and map it, project it to the sequence of, uh, of words properly uh, written, well, that's not just a, a single step. It's, 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 gonna, it's going to take a lot of work, a, l a very, mm, uh, uh, is going to end up with a very, very complex uh, WFST. So the purpose of rational operation and some others are basically to start from elementary uh, FST, so we'll take small graph and you have some operation defined on this small graph that will allow us to define bigger graph and this bigger graph will have some properties and we can understand and finally use in your, let's say, in your recognition system or whatever application. So we'll see three of these operations. The first one is a union. 
and this is probably the most simple one. So um, here, if you have two automata, so the, the once again, you imagine they are represented in terms of matrices and vectors, and what we are looking for is to build a new automata that will basically accept the union of all the, the, the sentences accepted by each of them individually. So if you have an, an automata that accepts all French sentences and an automata that accepts all German sentences, the union of them will accept French and German sentences uh, with the weight added. So here, um, the algorithm is kind of trivial and I want to understand what's going on here. So, first of all, we have a set of states from the first automata and a set of states from the other automata. So here's the whole idea, if you want to take the union, we simply, we want to make a copy-paste, basically, of, or just a, a uh, um, not a copy, but just uh, assembling all automata, separated, but just basically making them together, uh, 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 respecting, the not merging the state, basically, just adding the states, states together. So this is what you see here, is that we are stack, stacking like the, 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 the alpha and omega vector. is just taking, okay, now we have, a, um, we have a state space. Let's say that I have uh, two states from uh, uh, automata u, uh, one, and uh, a single state from automata b, that we'll call uh, q whatever prime. And just the union here means building a new state space that will just be the sum of the concatenation of these spaces. So just adding a, an extra dimension. So practically speaking, it just means making vector concatenation. And for the matrices, it just means taking the, 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 the block diagonal matrices. And here, I think we see already why there is a strong, let's say, um, um, motivation between this uh, like representation of FST in terms of matrices. The point is really not to go through the classical uh, aspect of a uh, classical uh, graph algorithm where we'd go, let's say, having a queue or making like directly for loop. We simply, for us, to enable the way of thinking with WFST just in terms of like well-known structure matrices and use a, a, a language of, uh, let's say, of operation that is known by most here. Uh, I think that even if you're, uh, I don't know, not expert in WFST, I think you all know how to concatenate a vector in NumPy, PyTorch, and how to make block diagonal matrices, meaning that you're already able to work with FST just with your background nowadays. So uh, here I, I show you an example of how we can implement it. So, so I will start to, to work uh, um, with our uh, toolkit. So this is what we'll uh, use uh, this afternoon. And we start with a set of symbols that has animals and vehicles. And uh, we have two separated FSTs. So these are acceptors, by the way. These are just automata. They are not, the, the input and output symbol are just the same. So it's, they are not doing any transduction. And uh, we have another uh, automata that just take into vehicles. And the whole idea is really to make the union of all of them. And once again, I gave you the formula of the union, concatenation of vector, building a block di uh, diagonal matrix, IATO. I heard there are a lot of checks, so I'm trying to adapt. So the, the, the union is this. So once again, I don't know if you open OpenFST, maybe uh, you did. And uh, uh, if you look at the, the implementation, you might be a little bit confused. I mean, though especially it's C++, so it's a little bit more complex, but here you have the whole uh, union operation defined for any type of... Oh, okay, good. So uh, all the operation uh, define the union operation defined for any FST, whatever the matrix, whatever the sparsity. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking about what you said, if you scroll back up a couple of... Uh, slides we just showed the concatenation of vectors so everything makes sense to me except alpha in the sense that uh, normally we would like to have a unique start state but if you just concatenate the two don't you end up with two start states uh, so Okay, so so Sanjeev is uh, first of all he knows a lot about this. So is uh, is is uh, making some assumptions. There, are, in my representation, I assume that you can have as many start states and wait for the initial start. I don't require to have uh, all of them to be uh, to be one. Uh, 
Um, however, there is a theorem that shows that all the uh, automata can be transformed into another equivalent automata that has a single start state. So it's quite common in the literature just to make this assumption. In my case, I didn't, so I just stack it. Um, so I didn't do the assumption, but in practice, I'm doing it the way I build. I already have one, and adding a when dealing with sparse vectors, adding a zero vector is constant time. So in a sense, I give a for generic formula with no overhead in computation, no matter what your underlying representation you have. So, and yeah, we were. So, so here, and this is just, I, I cannot run it because this is, um, uh, because, uh, because Windows. But the, the, um, this is just the outcome of the, of, the, of the algorithm. So here is just the implementation I really don't like to use. This is the exact uh, uh, implementation I'm doing, I'm doing. There is no underlying code. And this is the output. So here, there is not a single state. So, so we end up having a, a, a solution where we have two initial states. You can, of course, define a new algorithm with eventually um, a, a new epsilon states. Um, to answer, to, to be a little bit uh, more specific, I, in this framework, it, it's not necessary, it's not always advantageous to add a state with an epsilon connection because the, the matrix or the matrices can have factorization. So in a sense, adding a connection from uh, all initial states or having several initial states will not be more costly when at runtime because you can delay eventually the, the you can show it's kind of a factorization of the matrices. So that's eventually one design choice where, where that depart from the classical one. Don't you have to at least like uh, normalize the distribution of the initial states? Um, so so here you don't have to uh, wait and it does not necessarily represent distribution, probability distribution. So the, when you do the union, there is pretty much nothing to do on the weight, actually. It's just like, um, um, so, so just def defining, the, defining the automata of the, re the result of the uh, uh, union, you don't need to, 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 uh, to add or to modify the weight. What will be modified, though, is when you compute some operation, like you compute the sum of some paths, then some of the states, some of the paths will be added together, pass in the automata A, pass in the automata B, but this will be carried out by a later algorithm. Th there is a question behind you. Uh, so I assume that when you do the union between the two, um, you would expect that at some point you are allowed to do a path that uh, include uh, two elements uh, one belonging to one transducer and the other to the other, but if you have the two separate starts, you would never be able to do that. Um, here, notice that four is also initial state. So in a sense, I can start a computation. It's, it's really much, it's this represent, it's maybe more a problem for representation here. You can really start a computation from any four or one. You can imagine I have some extra state, let's say zero, that is as epsilon, that this zero would be the true initial uh, state and would go for four and go for one with the epsilon transition with uh, no input. It's just like in the way I work, and once again, it's, I'm not saying it's the best, it's, I assume that I can have multiple initial states and it's maybe a little bit less conventional. So you need some additional, let's say, modification in order to be able to do that. So, so no, 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 here the sum of all the, 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 this automata is equivalent to the one you're describing with a single initial state. The weight, if you compare the weight of the, all the strings uh, accepted, would be rigorously uh, equivalent. There is no differences. Maybe hold your question uh, and you will see eventually how we compute the sum of all paths later on and then it will become trivial that actually both one and four are perfectly valid uh, paths. I, I just want to maybe paraphrase like you was your question whether you can either have on input like the cars or the like the accept the cars or train or bicycle or the other one you cannot combine them right was this your question you cannot i think Uh, 
Uh-huh. I, I mis- yeah. No, no, th- that's a, I, I think you may want to think about it a bit because I think even if you take the union of the two and create that state, you'll never have a path that has one of these and one of those because it's the union of the two languages. You can either pick one string or the other. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I misunderstood your uh, your yeah, question. Yeah, that'll come later. Yeah. Oh, my bad, I, I misunderstood. So, concatenation then. <laughs> All right. So concatenation and it's it's here the the one it's one of uh, one of the operation that we define as rational is just like one of these elementary operation, and the whole idea is now. Basically, th- what Tina was uh, 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 puzzled is like uh, after the union, we could take either a train or a car or a bicycle or elephants or horse and everything. We could add, like just uh, make a sequence of them. So here's a concatenation. It will also combine these two automata in a different way. It will make uh, a, um, a concatenation of all the paths. So if, for instance, one automata is accepting train, and I concatenate it with another automata which accepts uh, uh, whales, then I can build the resulting automata will accept the string, train, and whales. Okay, so I'm just concatenating all possible paths of one automata and the other, uh, and all possible um, paths of the other automata. So once again, in here you will recognize that the algorithm looks awfully li- l- uh, similar to the union. So first of all, notice that we are making a state concatenation for the, uh, once again, we are basically extending our state space. And the similar thing happened with uh, alpha and uh, omega. So we are concatenating the initial weight of the automata A and initial, uh, initial weight of um, automata B. And here I have some zero multiplying the, the initial weight of B. So why I'm, but why I'm nullifying this, uh, this initial state of B? Any, any, any suggestion here? Exactly, so, so the concatenation means we are basically, if I have a set of like uh, uh, A, B, Sorry, I have a string A, B, that's my set, A, and uh, I have a, a U, 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 that would be the uh, set B. So if I'm making the concatenation of all uh, uh, elements, I'm building a new set where I have A, B, and uh, concatenated with U, U, U. So I have no elements starting from U, U, U. So that's the reason I'm just here stacking the vector just to indicate the dimension of how many elements I'm stacking. But essentially, I'm, I'm just making all these elements zero. And the same thing will happen here. I will just, for the omega, I'm fro- by multiplying this vector by zero, I'm just saying that I don't allow the resulting automata to end up in one state of uh, automata uh, A. I force the computation to end in one of the uh, state of B. So uh, there is an extra state here, and this comes maybe for the more traditional way of doing like union and concatenation, let's say in OpenFST, is to add some state for which there will be some uh, uh, connection with the epsilon label. So here this extra zero is just adding one of these states that will help us to connect everything together. So notice, once again, we are making the block diagonal matrix of A, A, and B. And here, it's a it's little bit more t- tedious, but you need to create a set of new edge that will, basically, you're creating a, a, an extra state, let's say a, a phony state, and all your final state of A, you need to connect them to the states with epsilon, and that will be the, 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 the it's not epsilon, yeah, epsilon, but with the weight, the, the final weight of, of uh, the, the automata A, so that's all these arcs. And you need also to add, um, from these states, you will actually add st- uh, starting emissions, starting, sorry, transition to all the initial state of automata B. So that's this alpha vector here. It's probably not very important that you map visually like everything what is going on. My point here is like for this concatenation, once again, the algorithm take a form that we are actually able to manipulate relatively easily. No. This building, this matrix is trivial if you're thinking in dense vector 
well, if you start to sink into sparse matrices, then you need to sink a little bit. So, I mean, I won't lie that some, there are rough corners, and sometimes the, represent the representation we chose uh, may make things a little bit uh, more tedious. But here, so here, this is an implementation of the concatenation, and it's just going over basically building a FST, and here you can recognize I'm building an initial vector by stacking uh, alpha A on alpha B, multiplying one by zero and adding a zero element. So, so well, it's a little bit tedious. And there I'm just building using concatenation, vertical, horizontal one. I'm building the whole big matrices I've just shown you. And finally, uh, so this is an example. And now you can train the, you can actually uh, ride an elephant and uh, ride an elephant again. I just uh, mix up the labels. Yeah, I did the concatenation with uh, the same uh, uh, FST. So that's uh, the, the second operation, rational operation. There is a last operation, which is, um, which is uh, the, the closure. And here the closure is just concatenating. Uh, you take one FSA or FST, and you will concatenate it with itself, with itself, with itself, infinitely. And you, con and you also allow this FST to end up after every stage of con uh, concatenation. So basically, we have uh, an FST or uh, let's say an automata that accepts a string A uh, and uh, A or and BB, and therefore you will, by making the, the closure, you will basically get an, uh, an, um, an automata that accepts A and BB, so it accepts the same, but it will also accept A. A, A, B, B, and uh, B, B, A, and B, 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 B. So that would be the level one of concatenating once. And then it will also accept uh, concatenating three times the initial one. So A, 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 B, B, and so on and so forth. And concatenating infinitely. So this, is, this infinity here is relatively easy to handle because we just have to build an automata where it has some ending states and we'll simply redirect this ending state to the initial uh, starting state and we go loop over and so on and so forth. So here the algorithm is again uh, uh, relatively simple. We take the automata, we stack, we add an extra dimension and uh, which is not a starting state and we'll simply add all uh, to this state, we'll simply add all the uh, a bunch of transition having the weight of the final weight, so just because uh, the it's just to, to propagate this weight instead of ending, we we'll propagate it to the epsilon uh, to the to the starting over state, and we do the same with the destination, and, and we are done. So once again, the code is is uh, what it is. We just need to understand the structure of our matrices, understand our format, how we store the sparse element. And then we can relatively easily build uh, the element, the, the, the final uh, uh, transducer. So this is an example here. So here we can take the car and go again and take the car again, probably stop, we arrive. Or we can continue and take the train, train the train, 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 take the bicycle, go back to the car, stop, and so on and so forth. So that's the rational operation. And you, I hope you already have some um, Look and feel about how things are working in this uh, linear algebra thinking of WFST, like modifying uh, FST or making defining operation on FST to induce another FST, finite state transducer, more or less involved to look at the matrix or matrices and vectors and to think, huh, for this new FST, how am I going to basically uh, uh, build the matrices? And one thing which is probably very important is like, if you look at the matrices, they have a very uh, determinist structure, I mean, very predictable structure. And the fact that you have a, such a structure, it's also a hint that most likely this operation can be factorized out. And when you do the computation of something like a little bit more heavy, this structure will be one of your allied if you want to parallelize, optimize, and everything. Um, I wanted to define uh, the composition, I need to be careful with the time. Okay, I think we still have time for this. These rational operations are very, let's say, they are the bread and butter of any practitioner of WFST, but they are not the most interesting one. Maybe the most, the, 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 the most valuable operation is the operation of composition 
And here we need to again to make the difference between automata and transducer. So, um, and let's think back with my initial, my first example where we have this uh, FST of uh, mapping like uh, uh, drinking and eating to some behavior. And I, I show you some other FSTs that were basically making some possible sequences of drinking and, and eating. So uh, intuitively we see that these two are related and we might eventually try to combine them, we might eventually ask questions. So here, let's consider this example and we can think, okay, this is a typical pattern where, as in real life, when you drink beer, you're sick, at least for me. And if you drink uh, wine, you're, you're good, and you might be questioning, uh, questioning yourself what would be the, the ideal behavior in your next party. I mean, I'm making it as a, as a toy example, but think of it like you have some FST that defines some mapping from, let's say, cause consequences or some uh, another language, from one language to the other language, and you want to, to operate, to use your function. It defines a function, you would like to use this function to find the outcome of some questions. So to do this, we need to use what is called the, the notion of, of composition. And loosely speaking, is going to give some input to this, uh, so input sequence to this uh, uh, transductor. So, so we'll give some, um, sorry, let me roll back. So here, we'll, for instance, we'll give a, a, a set of possible sequences I want to undertake. So for instance, fries, wine, beer, and beer. So I, I, I say, if for these sequences, I want to follow this one, uh, fries, wine, beer, and beer, but I want to know what will happen, and here it will be neutral, happy, happy, and sick. Okay? So, so I want to, to use this function, and, and I want to do it in the language of composition, of WFST, and that's the composition. Alors, so, so it is defined mathematically like this, but maybe look at the example. This is a code you want to implement in the OpenFST style. So that you can look, this is a picture from the paper from um, uh, Meyer uh, Mori, I don't know how to pronounce. And, and this is a, a, a simplified code here because it's only in terms of mathematics, um, uh, mathematical notation. If you look at the OpenFST code, uh, this is way more advanced actually because you need to think here you have a, a queue, you need to think about the policy on your queue, you need probably to have some uh, little bit higher thinking about the structures, eventually you want to sort the states to have it more efficient. So this algorithm here, it's already, I find it already complex, but it's way more complex in practice. So here I want to show you how it turned out to be uh, at least a naive version in terms of linear algebra. So once again, the composition is simply defined into a basically a three, four operation, and you're done. And here, be careful. This, uh, so it's a little bit confusing, but this uh, O plus, so this is between vectors and matrices, and I mean here the Kronecker product. So it's not the summering multiplication. Here I'm talking about vectors. And this is the Kronecker product, where here x11 multiply yy, matrix y will be the semi-modular semi scalar operation. So what I'm saying is like in this matrix for, uh, tensor representation, the algorithm that you're seeing just right here, more or less it's about the complexity of taking the Kronecker product between two matrices, so it's operation which is already defined in most of your toolkit, and you multiply with the matrix, and the multiplication here is just um, a binary matrix, so it's matrix with zero and one is just filtering out uh, some, uh, some edges. So here, S matrix is basically, remember, states by arcs. And when you do the Kronecker product, you actually create a little bit too many arcs. You want to remove some of them, so M matrix is just getting them out. And that's it. So you see here that the benefit of thinking in that way, looking at um, linear algebra perspective, is some, some complex operations that are, uh, once again, non-trivial, and probably this, you want to run it on GPU, for instance, you're going to have a hard time to, 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 to make this one. Whereas L redefining your set of operation to be classical linear operation, things get actually a little much e uh, much more easier. Much easier, sorry. Um, I, I didn't make the example here. Okay. So this was just example. Uh, so you, you, you can eventually see the behavior. So you have some... Uh, um, some possible uh, 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 action, uh, so some, some possible uh, yes, action, so uh, eating, drinking wine, drinking wine, and, uh, and if you compose, yes, exactly, so if you compose this one, 
if you compose this one with uh, with uh, party uh, FSTs and you obtain basically this result that you're fine, you've just drunk two glasses of wine, so you're good to go. Now I want to explain you a little bit why um, why the, the what I'm saying is actually makes sense. Why is this Kronecker product? How what I want to show is eventually how the, the little bit the inner of the Kronecker product, what it does. So here um, I'm just taking the Kronecker product of the two FST. So basically I will just do the carry on the, the Kronecker product between all alphas, source matrices, destination matrices. And what you end up is having uh, this enormous uh, FST which combines everything together. So it would make a state for any possible combination of states in st automata 1 and automata b, and the same thing with the arc. And uh, so it builds a gigantic automata, and the only thing you need to you see that this automata, a lot of these states here don't have any origin state, so you cannot actually reach them from the initial state. And therefore, it means that even though they are here, most of these uh, paths are actually completely useless. They are what we say unreachable. Moreover, uh, some of the combination here doesn't match it. So here the labels are not showing up in terms of beer, wine, and, and funny faces, but just by numbers. But you have basically the, some operation are simply not compatible. So you, you, you cannot, for instance, um, the, the, the transduction rule are not uh, approved, let's say. Uh, just to, to give you an example, if you have uh, a rule which says uh, uh, a fries are mapped to a neutral face, and you have the input which is uh, drinking beer, then there is no mapping between, so drinking beer again, there is no mapping between these two labels, so this transition carrying these two mapping, this uh, beer and this fries goes to neutral face, needs to we need to get rid of them. So that's the M matrix here, the M matrix is actually filtering everything out. And this is what you get once you apply this filtering. So you remember that we know we have a very large state space, but most of our matrix is completely empty. So even though we have a very big, big matrix, it's not a big problem for us because once again, we are using sparse array. They don't have a very high memory complexity. And eventually, if you want, so, so there are some states that are completely useless because you can never reach them. And eventually, if you want to, to, to do them, to, to remove them, it's just like connecting. But this is a, a, a n unnecessary step. It's just like if you want to, to your picture to look good. And that's the whole algorithm. Um, let me show you eventually the... the the, the code because just to, to to I want you to, to visualize uh, the, 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 the complexity, the algorithmic complexity. Uh, all right, let's forget it. I forgot on the URL. So uh, I, I should probably uh, I'll probably show you during the um, the, the, the the labs. All right, so let's now come to the most important part of this presentation because so far I have only talked about operation on FST that allows you that allow you to 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 to, to modify or transform or alter your your uh, FST so you can you start from building blocks and combining them in some sense you will end up with a bigger FST having like accepting different set of sequences so that's let's say the phase where you define the, the set of hypotheses you want to accept uh, the set of rules you want to define in your inference problem, but then you need to run the inference yourself. And most of the inference problem in machine learning when they are dealing with FST is about to compute what we call the weight of FST, or sometimes you might have heard of shortest distance problem. So here the idea is, is relatively simple. You get a FST, no matter what, how you get it, from a rational operation, you construct it manually, doesn't really matter. And what you're after is really to get all possible paths and compute the weight of this path, multiplying the weight of the transaction, and you add them together, all of them. And you, you want to, so this sum is, is most likely gigantic for most of the transducers, but you want to carry it, and that will give you some interpretation of your problem. In, for instance, in uh, machine learning, when you do, let's say, a hidden Markov model, we'll use this algorithm to calculate the probability of the audio given a pronunciation. If uh, you're doing ASR decoder, you change your summary ring and you do exactly the same 
computation, and you will get the probability of the most likely pass. And you can do the, the computing the water rates, computing the Levenstein distance, that actually requires to calculate all possible paths of a very specific FST, and you're done. So actually, even if you're not aware of it, most of your, let's say, problems in machine learning, uh, inference problem, whether it's for training or whether it's for uh, uh, at inference deployment, can actually be seen as computing the all the paths possible of some particular FST. Um, so, so you might have heard, for instance, it's just like a, one example, it's the tip of the iceberg. You might have heard about connectionist temporal classification, aka CTC, and, and that's just like a most trivial CTC you can think of. It's just like something, loosely speaking, it's like this kind of graph. So you can, you have a sequence of uh, states, which will depend on the, the number of frames you have in your uh, signal. And then you can either uh, do nothing, so that will be the blank symbol, or emit a transition, emit a, a label. And then you get uh, something else. You get, uh, you can basically blank, 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 and eventually go something, go over, produce your next label, and so on. So that's one particular case. Training among to calculate the sum of all these paths in the probability summering, or the log summering, because we know that they are isomorphic. Decoding for, let's say, the, the, the decoding implies to compute the same uh, sum of all the paths, but using the tropical summering. So uh, I'm, st I'm stressing this because this algorithm is probably the most important we are together. At the end of the day, all the operation I, I showed before, if they are taking time, they are, it's maybe not su such a big deal because eventually you will take time to build your graph, you can wait. But this algorithm, we can't really wait because this is the, the delay we have in our algorithm is the delay you have in your cell phone when you're speaking to it, when you are in a plane and the guy is speaking to giving some order. Like this algorithm is running, so we want this one to be fast and we want to be fast and, and sorry, having a low memory footprint. So this algorithm, so computing the sum of all the paths is something very critical. And we want to have this algorithm parallelized if we have the possibility and compressed, having a low memory footprint. The first thing, so, so let's, we'll show how to, com to compute the, 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 the shortest distance algorithm from a linear algebra algebraic perspective. So just using matrix vector multiplication. The first step is to take your S and D matrices and you transpose the D and you multiply it together. So remember that S is a source matrix, so on uh, the row side you have the states and on the colon you have the, the all the arcs. And the D matrix is the same, so you transpose it, you have the arcs and the states. And by doing so, you're actually building another, let's say, transition matrix, but this time it's an adjacency matrix. So let me explain the difference here. Let's say that we started from a FST or a, uh, automata here, and we have, let's say, one, we have two states, and between these two states, we have two transitions, okay? So after, making this uh, multiplication of S and D will have a matrix where a uh, matrix here is from, any, uh, from all possible source states to all possible destina de destination states. So it's a state to state matrices, matrix. And the combination will happen in such a way that when you have two states between, uh, two, sorry, two edges between two states, their weights will be added. So in a sense, we are just looking at our graph and whenever we have uh, two states that are uh, uh, connected by several uh, arcs, we are just making one arc and uh, multi uh, summing up the, all the labels. So we are compressing things. Okay, so that's uh, step one of the algorithm. Now let's look a little bit about the computation. So the computation is the sum of all possible paths, but you can also think of it as, okay, I will compute the weight of all the paths accepted by my automata, which have length zero. Right? And then I will add the weight of all the paths in my automata that have length exactly one. And then I will do the same thing. I will take the all the paths accepted by my automata that have length two, three, four, and you run till infinity. So you see that it's very, it's very natural. Like uh, 
if we want to sum all the paths that my automata is accepting, I just need to enumerate all the paths possible. And the way I do this is I will just sort this enumeration. I will start with the shortest path, length zero, then uh, longest, and then a path of length or, or a computation of length one, two, three, four, and so on. It's just the way I, I unfold this, uh, this big sum. Now things get interesting when we start to look about how to compute uh, this uh, intermediate step. So let's look at the, all the, 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 the two terms are actually very easy to compute. So here we are, one. so let me draw maybe so that it's a little bit more visual. A state of zero, uh, so, uh, let's consider the, the following. Let's consider the following FST. So we have, let's say, uh, one, two, and three. And we have one final state here. A state of, and this is uh, the, 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 final, the initial state. A FST accepting a path of length zero would mean that you can start in your initial state and you have also end in your initial state. So it would mean that your initial state or all of your initial states uh, have a, a, a non-zero weight, meaning you can start the computation here and end immediately without uh, going any, any of them. And if you want to compute the sum of all the paths of length zero, you need to go through your automata, look all the initial state, look whether they have a final weight, multiply these two weights, initial, final, and sum it together. And the way you do it is simply alpha transpose omega. Right? Every weight in alpha will be multiplied by its equivalent final state, and then you simply need to multiply everything together. Uh, to sorry, to summering the, the summary, uh, to sum in the summering to get the, the final score. And here you will get the path, the length of all the the the, the sorry. You will get the sum of all the paths of having length zero. All right. This is important here. So um, if you have questions, don't uh, don't hesitate. All right. So now we can do. Uh, what about W one? W one, meaning like the weight of the atoma automata for uh, all the paths having length one. What you need to do is to enter some initial state, do exactly one transition, and check if the transition here have some final states and multiply everything together and sum. So here we have two transitions. We have transition three. Three is the final state, so it will contribute to the sum. We can make this transition, but two is not a final state, so it will not contribute to the transition. So the thing we are going to do is simply alpha. We need to take into account the initial weight. We need to do one step, so we'll multiply alpha by t. So here is just making one step forward. In the, the so you will end up having a vector carrying the weights, non-zero weights at the, 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 the state you're exploring, and multiply again by omega. So let me decompose again the, the operation. You start your computation, so meaning you're entering your state. You multiply this resulting vector, this vector by t, the transition matrix, and you end up, you end up having one step further in your transition. And then you take this vector, which is a transpose vector, and you multiply it with omega, and that gives you all the paths of length one. So I think um, we can think a little bit more about the, the problem for weight two, for, for sorry, for the sum of all the weights of length two, three, four, and so on. But it's, uh, I think it's, it should be fairly straightforward to realize that it's just about continuing to multiply the matrix even further. So if you want to state of weight, um, so the sum of all the, the paths of weight of the paths of length two, then you need to start in some initial state, do one step, meaning multiply by t, so that would be alpha transpose t, initial pro initial uh, uh, entering the initial state, going one step further, and then you want to go one step further, so you need to multiply again by t, and finally multiply by omega. So here you will multiply by omega. And 
you start to get the pattern that you will have something alpha transpose t power n omega. That would be the sum of all the paths of exactly n of, of length exactly one. Or let me say it again. Uh, I just see a question. Uh, that will be the sum of all the of the path weight of <laughs> it's difficult to say it uh, in, in English. So it will be the sum of all the paths of all the pass weights and each uh, for the pass having a length exactly of n. Yeah, Sala. So uh, small question. So when you when you do this alpha uh, t computation, where do you get exactly the information about the state you're going to being terminal or not? To be added to W1 or W2? Or is this, sorry, could you say it again? So w where exactly do you get the information about the state being terminal or not to actually be added there? So like it's omega. So, so let's, let's represent things differently. So we have uh, one, three, and one, two. And we say that one is initial, so it has a st uh, arcs coming in, and it has arcs coming out. And it has some uh, state, let's call it alpha one and omega uh, three, for instance. So the vector omega is a vector of dimension Q, where all the non-zero will be the, for each, a non-final state will have element zero in uh, omega, and the final, and here the state number three will have Omega three. That's answer your question. Yeah. So therefore, when you do the let's say the, the dot product uh, uh, with any of them, you're just having a vector of states with weights, and you simply make the dot product, and you get like the, the whether or not like the, the if, if there was if there is a weight zero, you say okay, this state is not final, so I don't care. I remove it. I saw some hand raising, maybe or or maybe not. Uh, sorry. Another way of saying it, maybe you are when if you have a, a, a investigating a little bit about speech decoding, you have might have heard about this problem of token passing, right? So token passing meaning we start to you 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 will build a, um, a propagation a mechanism of propagation. You will enter a state, and you get a, a weight as input. So let's say W E, and you will propagate this weight. Let's say your your arcs have a weight x and y. And then you know that your weight is as a two successors, and you will multiply, uh, uh, you will duplicate the token here in two new tokens with weight wi and x and wy and y. So here, it's the algorithm is exactly the same, except that I express it in terms of matrix vector multiplication, eventually to highlight the parallelizable nature of this algorithm. But technically speaking, I'm doing nothing more than a token passing algorithm. Sure. Um, and what is this capital W uh, useful for? So, yeah, I didn't make it probably uh, 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 like uh, applicable enough. Uh, so, the weight of this automata is most likely what you're interested in. So, for instance, um, you want to know uh, the probability of a sequence given a set of hypotheses. Well, that's the sum here. You need to consider all possible hypotheses and you will sum it together. What maybe is missing is, m we, for instance, we, we can start with a language which has all possible uh, uh, sentences and we'll apply a, a operation of filtering, which is analog analogous to the composition, and say, okay, from this set of, of sentences, I will filter out all uh, uh, strings that correspond to my name is X, for instance. And then you have already uh, uh, automata, which is in the, set, in the space of permitted languages, but at the intersection between permitted languages and a specific sentence that you give, and this automata gives you all pronunciation possible. Okay, and now I give you a piece of audio, and I'm asking, okay, what is the the probability of this uh, of this uh, piece of audio, uh, given your model and given your transcription, which is my name is X. So that's that would be this algorithm. And if you change the semi ring, you do run exactly the same algorithm, and you would get let's say the max probability of the maximum state. Or if you change again the algorithm, you can find the alignment. Or this, I understand, it's a little bit abstract, but most of your loss and most of your uh, deployment or inference problems are actually this sum. 
But I understand it's, it's not so visible maybe at, at first sight. Okay. So, um, so, so by induction, we can quickly see that actually the whole algorithm is just uh, initial weight transpose T star matrix, where T star is basically T power, uh, there is a T power zero missing here. So T power zero plus T power one plus T power two, and so on and so forth. So this formula, it's, it's, it's actually very nice because it will lead to a implementation which is very easy. And I will make two comments before to show you the, the implementation. We'll end up on this. This T star, it may be a little bit scary because it's summing infinitely is uh, it's a little bit problematic. Uh, however, uh, we know for many in many cases we know that this um, this sum at some point the matrix the T power uh, we know that T power K matrix will be equal to zero for some K. So there are some properties that define it. One of them is if your graph is, has no cycle. And that's kind of obvious because if your graph has no cycle, at some point you will reach a position where going to the next step going leads you to anywhere, so intuitively it will be zero. But that's not the only case. You can have cycle, but your summary ring has some properties that makes it that no matter what you do, even if you take cycles, you will still end up in, in, uh, in zero. And so, so the, 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 the behavior of the sum is most of the time, or in the case we are interested, uh, uh, valid. And then we end up with this algorithm to compute this whole weight. We start, so it's a recursive algorithm. We start with a vector, which we initialize at the alpha. And then we recursively compute this vector transpose the transition matrix. And the result is basically the sum of this vector multiplied by the omega and accumulated over the way. And at some point, we know that this product is going to be zero, or it will not change anymore. So we, we are, are, are making it. So I will end up on this uh, example. So this is actually the implementation of what I'm, I was describing. And I want to appreciate, uh, so first of all, probably we want to go a little bit through the code to understand what's going on. The first step is to compute the T matrix. Remember that the, the we started to get rid of this uh, uh, source and destination matrices by making a smaller matrix, which is a state by state matrix. And that's the only one we are working with. And then I initialize my uh, un with a vector alpha. And I also initialize my accumulator. And then I'm making a for loop and I'm just checking until when um, the result is basically uh, nothing but zero. And I'm just carrying the equation I've shown you. So taking the transpose un multiplied by t and transposing back. Be careful. Uh, summary ring, the, sum or the, the linear algebra with summary ring is not necessarily summary ring, so this is not equal, this line is not equal to T transpose UN, right? So depending on the summary ring. And then uh, we just uh, accumulate the, the product and, and we are good to go. So this algorithm, it's, it's not visible, I mean, it's, it's maybe. It, it may be a little bit surprising, but here, this is a, a full-fledged ASR decoder. This is just it. It's like four or five lines of code. It comes with, of course, some like uh, uh, cautions, but from a very understanding perspective, when you do a, a LVSR decoder, the next time you think about Siri, you, you, you use Siri, think about this one. It's, it's nothing more than that. And it's also showing this uh, algorithm in terms of, of uh, of, uh, of this structure, of this operation, greatly simplifies uh, the, the way we address the problem. It makes things trivial to eventually, if you want to decode on GPU, for instance, well, that's a much easier task uh, uh, to, to implement because we know how to make a vector multiplied by a matrix on GPU, and so on and so forth. For, yeah, sorry. Alan, could you go a little bit up, please? Uh, yeah, up in the slides. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was a little bit confused just about just T, T star. Uh, yeah, if you okay. just stop right here. Uh, well, so I thought we were multiplying the T's to to uh, estimate the W um, yes. of an index, but T star you add it. Uh, yeah. that's confusing. So, so that's that's a good remark. So, 
So first of all, the t star, there is a t power zero missing. Uh, there is a typo. So the whole weight of the automata is given by W zero of A plus, I mean, summering plus W one of A plus W two of A and so on and so forth, okay? So the way I compute W0 is alpha transpose omega. So I'll write it like this, it's t power zero omega. Then W1 is t power, power one of omega, and I can continue uh, down. A is alpha transpose t power two omega. So now if you rewrite the factors here, you will have alpha transpose t power zero omega plus, so this is just a scalar, right? Transpose matrix vector column is scalar, plus alpha transpose t power one omega, let's make it uh, another one, alpha transpose t square omega. And because the summering operation on the semi-module has the same properties as real numbers like distributivity and factorization, then we are able to say, okay, this is going to be to be alpha transpose of t power zero plus t power one plus, and so on. You understand? Thank you. Uh, so here it's not O plus because the O plus only work, I mean, the way I define it, it means the summering operation. So here, you're adding scalars. Here, the plus notation is a semi-module notation, which is an element-wise summering addition of t's, right? So it's a little bit confusing, but basically when, in the code and in the, in the presentation, when I use this natural addition, uh, in most of the case, I'm meaning addition of tensors, uh, vectors, matrices. When I use O plus or O, multi o times, I'm talking about scalar operation. So I think that's it. I will end up on uh, this. Uh, this was probably some debugging, and obviously uh, I'm a reason reasonable person, so I don't drink beer. <laughs> so thank you for your attention, and uh, probably we'll have time to discuss during the labs uh, this afternoon. <laughs>